evening, uh, Aguila Ushla, and thanks for the invitation to speak tonight. Always a pleasure. Now, the Spanish Armada and the Spanish Armada and the, the, the way it impacted upon Ireland are very, very big subjects. And we could literally talk all night about any one aspect in all of those things. Uh, so the best I can do, and the best I can hope to do, is to give you a sort of a general overview of the reasons why the Armada was put together in the first place and the events that led up to how uh, a great many of the ships were wrecked on the Irish coast. Now, the word Armada in Spanish uh, literally just means a fleet, a large fleet usually. And this particular Armada of 1588 was put together by King Philip II of Spain for the purpose of invading England. Now, there were a number of reasons for that. King Philip II of Spain, in an age of religious fanaticism, he was literally leading the pack. He was a very, very, his most Catholic majesty, King Philip of Spain, he was a very, very devout Catholic, and he had a particular hatred of those whom he regarded as the heretics of Protestantism. But there were a number of reasons, as I said, including religious, there were economic and political reasons also. On the opposite side of the coin, he, he reserved a particular hatred among uh, those whom he regarded as heretics for his sister-in-law, Elizabeth I of England. <clears throat> Now, I just tell, just just before we move on to that, I'll just tell you about there were 130 ships left Spain, left Portugal, actually, because that was part of Spain then, uh, with the intention of invading England. And it's generally reckoned that 26 of them were wrecked on the Irish coast. So that's more or less what we'd be focusing upon. But from an economic point of view, uh, Spain's economy was largely dependent upon its overseas possessions. And a huge amount of treasure, gold and silver and plate, was coming back from its, its colonies overseas in South America, Central America, North America, and Mexico, and in the Far East. And there were incursions being made uh, into those possessions and into the treasure fleets which were coming back by English pirates such as Francis Drake, and we'll be telling you about it in a minute. But he was anxious to pursue uh, the invasion of England from much earlier. From In 1571, he wrote this letter to the Duke of Alva. I'm so keen to achieve the consummation of this enterprise. I am so attached to it in my heart. I am so convinced that God, our Saviour, must embrace it as his own cause, that I cannot be dissuaded from putting it into operation. Now, it was a further 18, 17 years before he finally got around to doing that. Now, Philip quite possibly regarded himself as the rightful ruler of England because he had been married to Queen Elizabeth's half-sister, Mary Tudor, who was uh, the daughter of Catherine of Aragon and who was a devout Catholic. So Philip and Mary had sat on the throne of England. Uh, and she, unfortunately, she died early on. Philip, she died fairly young and Philip drifted away from the English court. And he, as I say, he might more or less have regarded himself as the rightful ruler of England. This is the escutcheon of one of the great guns that was found uh, up in Donegal, uh, a great big siege cannon, and it shows the combined arms of Spain and England. It was cast during the reign of Mary Tudor. Mary Tudor's reign was characterised by persecution of Protestants. She was a really devout Catholic herself, so much so that she became known as Bloody Mary. It was generally reckoned that the, the escutcheon on the gun would have been painted like this to show off the arms. One of the main people who did incursions into the Spanish possessions overseas was this man here, a very quixotic figure called Francis Drake. He was a great seaman. He'd been a, around the world, as a, but like he was a part of the English Navy, but basically he could be said to have been just a pirate. There was a, a very odd state of undeclared war existed between Spain and England at this stage. And Drake was predating upon the Spanish treasure fleets that were coming back from the Indies. Uh, he had a fanatical hatred of the Spaniards. Just as Philip had a hatred of Protestantism, Drake had a hatred of the Spaniards. Because during one incursion into, a, into the West Indies, some of his men were captured. He, almost, he just evaded capture himself. And they were brought back to Spain and put on trial to, to get them to recant their Protestant faith, which they wouldn't do. So they were subjected to what was known as the auto de fe, which was meant burning alive in public. So you can understand that he would have had a lot of uh, hatred. Uh, uh, Queen Elizabeth was financing a lot of his operations and was getting a share of the spoils on the QT. 
Now, another spore, another thing which spurred on the uh, preparations for the invasion for the Armada was the execution uh, the year before it took place in 1587 of Mary, Queen of Scots, who was actually by blood and legitimacy the, the rightful heir to the throne of England. If you discount the fact that people, uh, Catholics, regarded Elizabeth as being illegitimate and being a heretic, uh, Mary, Queen of Scots, would have been next in line. She was the great granddaughter of of Henry the Seventh. Henry the Eighth was her granduncle. Uh, now the preparations took a few years uh, to get the Armada ready, and ships and equipment and men were brought in from all over the Spanish Empire, and the task of assembling it. And leading it, leading the, the enterprise was given to this man here, the Marquis of Santa Cruz, an extremely able seaman and soldier who had a whole lifetime of fighting on land and on sea behind him. And he was one of the main protagonists, one of the men who was sporting, excuse me, Philip on to, to, to get things going. Now, despite uh, the fact that there was 130 ships and about 30,000 men involved in the Armada, it wasn't really enough, according to the Marquis of Santa Cruz. The estimates he had put given to Philip would have uh, taken account of about nearly twice that amount of ships and men and equipment. Nevertheless, they cobbled together what they could. Uh, now, unfortunately for Philip, uh, the Marquis of Santa Cruz was to die during the preparations for the Armada, and the task was given to the, the most senior nobleman in Spain, who was involved in the logistics end of assembling the equipment and the men for the Armada. And he was a good organiser, but by his own admission, he, had no, he hadn't got much experience of warfare, either on land or on sea. He despised ships, and he got chronically seasick whenever he, he got aboard one. And he pleaded with Philip to be allowed uh, to be excused from taking on the task. But Philip was adamant, and Med the Duke of Medina Sidonia, and he stepped up to the plate, manfully. But I think it was probably a mistake, as we'll see. In the year before the Armada took place, Francis Drake made a very daring assault on Cadiz for a particular purpose. And he did something there that was, was to affect the whole outcome of the Armada. Uh, he sailed in with 30 ships into Cadiz Harbour under the guns of the fort, and he shot up the town for two days, sank about 100 ships in the harbour, put a big large party of men ashore, armed men, and they burned a whole lot of stores that were being prepared. Cadiz was one of the main places where the Armada was being prepared from a logistics point of view. But more importantly, there was tons upon tons of barrel staves on the key wall drying out uh, for to make the barrels that would hold the water for the fleet. And he burned every one of them. He burned, I forget how many thousand tons of oak staves he burned. But he, like, he knew what he was doing. The, 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 it was the worst kept secret in Europe. The English knew everything that was going on. There was a huge amount of trade back and forth between the continent and England and, and uh, indirectly with England uh, from ports in Spain. And it was a very large spy network orchestrated by Elizabeth's spy master, Francis Walsingham, wonderfully played by Geoffrey Rush in the film, uh, Elizabeth. But he knew these barrel staves were there, and that's what he went after, and he burned them. And it was to have a detrimental effect on the outcome of the Armada because they had to go off and get fresh timber, unseasoned timber, and make barrels from that. And they all leaked, and the water went bad and everything else. So it had a, it had a dire effect upon the, the outcome. The Armada finally set sail on May the 9th, 1588. It set sail from Lisbon. It was being prepared in Lisbon. Portugal had been annexed by Spain at this stage. It was part of Spain. Now, there was a fleet of 130 ships. Uh, they weren't all warships. They, were, they had begged, borrowed, and stolen ships, bought ships in. Uh, some of them were just big merchantmen, and they converted them into warships by cutting gun, extra gun ports into them. And that was to have an effect, too, and so far as it weakened some of the ships. They weren't really suitable. They weren't designed for that. But... Um, there was also a, a flotilla of galleasses, oared galleasses, that were much more suitable to the calmer waters of the Mediterranean and the Adriatic. Uh, they were oared galleasses. They had a rig of sail, but they had oars as well uh, on the other side. And one of them was wrecked uh, in Ireland, as we'll see. But 
from the very outset, they were dogged by bad weather. They were leaving at a time when the weather should have been nearly at its best, from May onwards. And from the very moment they left, the gales sprung up, westerly gales that just increased in ferocity and kept blowing for weeks on end. And it was afterwards known as the Protestant wind, which I'll tell you a little bit more about that later on. So they had no sooner left uh, Lisbon than they ran into a whole, a, a great big westerly gale, and they had to put into La Coruña up here in northwestern Spain. You can see it up there. Now, just take a look at the, the configuration of La Coruña there. But later on, Francis Drake made a raid on, it was more than a raid, it was an invasion, of, an attempted invasion of La Coruña to take over the port. It would have given them a huge strategic advantage if they had been able to take La Coruña and hold on to it. However, that was unsuccessful, as we'll see later on. So the fleet was scattered. And by arrangement, if that uh, were to happen, they were to reassemble in La Coruña. And they all have ultimately straggled in after a while. Uh, a fact that was very little known to history until an American scholar called Gareth Mattingly discovered it uh, was the fact that a fleet of 90 ships left England as soon as the Armada sailed from Lisbon. The moment the Armada set sail, fast dispatch boats uh, that were in the pay of the English headed up and brought the news up to the English people, and they, they, they literally knew every move that was going on. But so they, they, they dispatched a fleet under, under Francis Drake to try and meet the Armada out in the open sea. And who knows what would have happened had that occurred. They probably would have tore into them and uh, did awful damage. But that fleet was scattered by the same gale, and they had to put back into the English ports. So they didn't leave La Coruña then until the 22nd of July. And... By the 29th of, and the 30th of July, they were up off the Lizard on the southwest coast of England. And they were forming up into this great crescent formation that was to, uh, they were to keep throughout the whole of the voyage, or for, throughout most of the whole of the voyage. It was a clever naval formation insofar as the heavy warships were on the outside and the transports and the oared galleys were on the inside. And if anything tried to attack them, uh, in the middle, from any direction, they would just literally close on it like a set of horns. And they headed off up the English Channel. Now, the objective was to link up with the Army of Flanders. I'll tell you a bit about it now in a moment. A great big Spanish land army that was in the Low Countries. So you've all heard the story of Drake at Plymouth Hoe. The moment the Spaniards were sighted, there was a whole lot of uh, signal fires all along the south coast that were lit. And uh, the famous story about when somebody brought the news to Drake that the Spaniards had been sighted, he famously said, look, we've plenty of time to finish the game of balls and we can deal with the Spaniards afterwards. A lot of truth in that because there were, these were great seamen. Drake and all his fellow sea captains were very, very experienced sea captains. They knew all of the currents and the tides of the English Channel uh, by heart and they knew exactly where they were going, how they were going to engage with the Spaniards as they sailed up the Channel. There were some very experienced men with them. All had been plundering on the Spanish main also and were great explorers. You might even call them pirates and privateers and what have you. John Hawkins and Martin Frobisher all had been uh, crossed in the, in the Atlantic over to the Americas. And the man in overall charge was Lord Howard of Effingham, another very capable seaman. He was the Lord High Admiral. Drake was his second in command. But it seems that Elizabeth was very parsimonious with her, uh, with her suppliers and with money, with providing money and equipment, because the English archives in the Armada section is full of these begging letters and from the likes of Howard and Drake, pleading for more men, pleading for more ammunition, pleading for more gunpowder, and very little was forthcoming. So, now, there were differences between the, the methods of warfare pursued at sea by the English fleet and by the Spanish fleet. This was a typical Spanish gun carriage. Uh, it, was, it looked more like a, a land gun, a land uh, weapon uh, with just two wheels. And it was said that it, th th this style of English gun carriage was even then in use. And this style, this is just a model, but this model continued in use right for hundreds of years later on, still in use at the time of Trafalgar under Nelson. And it was said that for every one shot that the Spanish gunners got off, that the English could fire off four. The real objective of the Spanish, the, the, the Spanish Navy was to, to close with the enemy, to grapple with them, and to board, and then uh, take over the ship with hand-to-hand -hand fighting. Whereas 
The English had a different method of fighting. They darted in, got in, fired off their broadsides and got back out again. And it was said that the English fleet were longer and narrower and more manoeuvrable. Some of them were known as race, uh, race fitted ships or something like that. But uh, I think that there might be a, a strong element or two, although there were some very, very big ships in the English fleet. But that was the, the, the essential difference. And the Spaniards were, were forever screaming at them, telling them they were cowards to come and engage with us. So after nearly a week sailing up the English Channel, the Spanish fleet came to anchor off Calais. And the English fleet stood off. Now, the objective was that they were to team up with the land army that was in what was then known as the Low Countries, today Holland, Belgium, and part of France. But that was a Spanish possession. And there was a, a continual war going on there between the rebellious Dutch. Uh, many of the Dutch from the, the Dutch provinces had rebelled against Spanish rule. And a great big land army uh, that was there, the, the Army of Flanders, it was under this man here, the Duke of Parma, Alexander Farnese, another very capable soldier. But the Dutch were very wily and they were using their boats, their, their, their shallow draft boats to great advantage to, to, to avoid conflict, to avoid engaging with the the army and to get round behind them and they get up to all kinds of tricks with our with our with our, our shallow draft boats. And Parma was having a great the difficulty coping with that. Now the plan was for Parma to have his army ready to embark on the Spanish fleet. To have a lot of boats and barges ready for to do that whilst the Spanish fleet was anchored off Calais. Now unfortunately he wasn't ready because he simply couldn't get enough boats. A lot of them were destroyed by the Dutch in quick raids. And he was having a torrid time trying to get enough small vessels to transport his army out aboard the fleet. So he sent word out to Medina Sidonia that he simply wasn't ready. Now, at this stage, the English decided to play very dirty. They were mounting westerly winds, very strong westerly winds, gone blowing continually, which was ideal for this purpose. As the English sent down fire ships in among the anchored Spanish fleet. And what happened next was to have a detrimental effect for the whole rest of the, 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 the Spanish undertaking. Now, fire ships were a dreaded form of war naval warfare. They were filled up with all kinds of incendiary materials, oil and tar and pitch and anything, gunpowder, anything that had borne which The ships themselves were very inflammable back then. They, they were all wood and rope and oil and tar and everything else. And it was a dreaded form of naval warfare and the only thing that the Spaniards could do was to get out of there as quickly as possible and to that end they did something that they were to regret later on. They all cut their anchors or slipped their anchors, cut the cables and got out of there as quickly as they could and tried to form up again in their crescent formation. Now that was to have a great effect later on with a great many ships. I think this picture as far as I know is by Richard Bridges Beachy and it's a very large painting that was in an institute in Plymouth and as far as I know it was destroyed in the blitz in the bombing by German bombs during the second world war and it shows the fire ships in among the Spanish fleet it's a very very dramatic looking painting indeed I'm almost sure that's uh, that is the one now all during the next day after the fire ship episode the English tore into the Spanish fleet as they were trying to uh, form up again in their crescent formation now, it became known as the Battle of Graveline. Now, Graveline is the place between, between Dunkirk and Calais here, that stretch there. Uh, now, up to this, there were very few losses. There was only one ship taken as a prize by Francis Drake in the battle coming up the channel. And there was only one other ship lost that went aground on a sandbank just off Graveline somewhere off the coast of Belgium. But nevertheless, the English fleet had managed to inflict a huge amount of damage on the Spanish ships with their gunnery. Their gunnery was more accurate than the Spaniards, and they inflicted a huge amount of damage. Now, there was a lot of damage done to the English fleet also, but nothing like that which they inflicted on the Spanish fleet. A great many of them were whole, and the rigging you know, battered, literally. Mass damage, a whole lot. So, uh, that's supposed to be a depiction of the Battle of Graveline, but it's not very dramatic. Now, at this stage... The Duke of Medina Sidonia made a very faithful decision. And it's generally reckoned if, if the previous commander had been in, uh, in charge, that he may have done things differently. The Duke of Medina Sidonia decided, that's it. We can't go any further. We're going home. <laughs> they couldn't go back. 
down the channel because of the westerly winds and the presence of the English fleet. And Parma wasn't ready. They couldn't anchor off to wait for Parma. So he decided that's it. We're going home. Now, a more resolute commander might have decided to go up into the North Sea somewhere and try and evade the English fleet and have a come back down and have another go at it when Parma was ready. But Medina Sidonia, he kind of had to live with the disgrace of that for the rest of his life. But he was held in disgrace by a lot of people in Spain for calling off the enterprise. So he decided that the way back was to sail up the North Sea, around the north coast of Scotland, out into the Atlantic and head back down for Spain. Now, of the 130 ships that left Lisbon, 90 got back to Spain. 26, at least 26, were wrecked on the Irish coast. The two down in the Channel and one on Fair Isle. That left about 10 or 10 to 15. I can't remember exactly, but it's generally reckoned that most of the ones that weren't accounted for must have sank at sea or... Indeed, they could well have been wrecked on the Irish coast in places that were then uninhabited. There's a great deal of the coast, particularly in Donegal, during this period, uh, didn't have any population at all. It was uninhabited. It wasn't until later dispossessions occurred that the population moved out to the coast. So there may well be more wrecks on the Irish coast than was previously thought. But one of the reasons why the ship were wrecked, and a contributory factor was the fact that the maps that were being used by the Spaniards at the time looked like this. They showed practically all of the west coast of Ireland as a virtual straight line and didn't take account of the great big mass of Eris sticking out into the Atlantic. And they may have uh, just miscalculated and literally been too close to the, the shore and didn't get a, enough of an offing. Uh, there's another contemporary map which shows much the same thing. Some, sh- some of the ships stood well out into the Atlantic. The Duke of Medina Sidonia sent around the message, be careful lest you fall upon the Ireland the island of Ireland, for fear of the harm that may befall you on this coast. Now, that was to prove to be a very prophetic message. Because, as I said, at least 26 ships did fall on the Irish coast, with the loss of about 5,000 men as well. That's a contemporary map of Ireland, just for a comparison. If you came close in around Donegal at all, you'd have the big mass of errors there facing you. Now, word soon got out that Spanish ships were either coming into anchor to look for provisions or water, which not all of them were actually blown in. Uh, some of them actually came in and were subsequently wrecked. And that large masses of armed men were coming ashore. Ward got back to the authorities in Dublin on the Fitzwilliam. And he sent out a message to all of his commanders out in the wilds uh, that no prisoners were to be taken. If there were Spanish prisoners uh, taken, they were all to be executed. So that was uh, followed up with great zeal by this man here. He was the sheriff the High Sheriff of Connaught, Sir Richard Bingham. Now, he had fought alongside the Spaniards at the Battle of Lepanto and other places like that. However, he pursued that direction with great zeal. And he sent out a directive that anybody who gave succor or help to the Spaniards would be killed. And that if any Spanish Spanish prisoners or Spanish people came into their possession or uh, came near them at all, they were to be taken and handed up to the authorities or put to death by them. And unfortunately, that was the case because a great many people were living in fear of the English rule at the time. And their their, their hold on their own land was very tenuous, you know, literally at the grace and favour of the English at this time. I just, just in the immediate aftermath of the Armada, there was quite a lot of diving done to recover. It was, it was known that there was a lot of very, very valuable brass guns, particularly on a lot of the wrecks, and the location of them was known. So there were several divers engaged by the English and what have you, to, uh, to look for these valuable brass guns using this sort of an apparatus there. There was one in particular called Jacob the Diver, Jacob Janzoon, who was a Dutchman and who recovered guns in various uh, sites. Just got that out of the way there. But that will just give you an idea of the locations of the wrecks. There's every county on the west coast and two counties on the north coast of Ireland have wrecks, all I think with the exception of Leithram. All of the counties from Donegal down to Kerry have Armada wrecks on them on the coast and as I said there may well be other ones up here on the the wild part of bloody foreland and places like that now I'm not going to deal with all of these wrecks individually because there are far too many of them what I'm going to do is just tell you about some of the the major ones which resulted in fines and discoveries later on some of them now two ships came into Blacksod Bay under the command of a, a very important man in the Armada Don Alonso de Leva a very important uh, nobleman and a very, very experienced soldier and sailor as well. 
Uh, he was effectively the second in command, and there was a great many people felt that he should have been in command of the Armada itself. Perhaps if he had been, uh, things might have been slightly different. But his, the name of his ship was La Rata and Coronada, and he came in, he came in, in a, uh, from here, heading a, in an easterly direction to try and get an anchorage so that he might get ashore to try and find water and some provision. Because at this stage, the water had all turned bad in the casks by virtue of the wood being unseasoned. And some of the casks had burst, what have you. Uh, so they were very, very badly short of water. The other ship that came in with him just headed north. They got split up, headed north. The name of that one was the Duqueza Santa Ana. Now, both ships were subsequently to be wrecked in that particular area. When De Leva approached the coast, he found that the anchors wouldn't hold. He hadn't got adequate anchors. He had left his anchors behind at Graveline. And the anchors that he had didn't hold. So he actually drove in and went ashore in that little bay there, just in the south part of Black Sod Bay. And the ship was a total loss. So he decided to go ashore, bring all his men and equipment, as much as he could possibly bring ashore. And they burned the wreck. And it didn't burn all the way down. And very shortly afterwards, those whom they refer to at all times as the local savages descended upon it like locusts and stripped everything they could off it. So De Leva knew that uh, the Duquesa of Santa Ana was further north in Black Sod Bay. So he set out on a march north and he linked up with the ship and got all his men aboard the Duquesa of Santa Ana and they managed to get back out of Black Sod Bay and headed north. Now, they nearly twice, the, that's a picture of Don Alonso De Leva there, apparently a very, very capable uh, soldier altogether. The problem only exacerbated itself. They were chronically short of water. They hadn't been successful in getting water in Black Sod Bay, so they decided to put in here, uh, in this part of Donegal, to a place called Lockross Bookmore Bay. Now, the very same thing happened there that had happened to the Leva down in Black Sod Bay. The anchors wouldn't hold when they tried to get an anchorage, and the ship drove in on the, on the shore and was lost. And they did the very same thing there. They set fire to the ship and got everything they could ashore off it. Um, now, they set up camp in a little castle in a place called Kilturish Lake. It was a, you could wade out to the castle. So they brought a huge amount of their guns and their equipment and their stores ashore with them and set up a camp around Kilturish, centered on the little castle that was there. Word came to them then that there were three ships down in Killybegs, further south down here at the north end of Donegal Bay. So they up stakes and they set off down south to join up with the ships in Killybegs. Now at this stage, the labor was on a stretcher. He, got a, he, had broken, he had gotten a broken leg from a capstan went flying around and one of the capstan bars hit him on the leg, broke his leg. So he was being carried on a stretcher. When they got to Killy Beggs, they found there was only one ship there. The other two ships had sunk, but not before the people who on this ship had taken some timbers off one of the ones that sunk. The ship that was there was called the Girona and it was an Ord Galias. It was a flotilla of these in the Armada. They would have been, you know, for patrol duties on the Mediterranean. And they, they weren't really suited, as I said, to the rigours of the North Atlantic. They had a full rig of sail, but I think they had about uh, 20 oars on either side as well. Very manoeuvrable now in, in close-in warfare. Very handy for that, all right. So the Labour took charge, and they had also taken off the crew of a smaller vessel in Black Sod Bay that had come in, a small transport. So effectively, there were the crews of five different ships at Killy Beggs, and which amounted to about 2,000 men. So De Leva crammed as many people as he could, got repairs done to the ship. The rudder had carried away, and they did a jury rig on the rudder. And he crammed about 1,500 people into the Girona and left the rest behind, and they set off. He decided to go north about. He decided to go north and avail of the westerly wind to get over to neutral Scotland with a, a, a chance then of getting back to Spain uh, from neutral Scotland. Scotland was neutral uh, and in, totally independent from England at the time and was more favourable towards the Spaniards now than the English, I might add. Everything was going grand and they were getting tossed about all right and the rudder wasn't holding out very well, but it was adequate enough. But on the night of the 26th of October, the wind turned around and started to blow very strong northerly. Everything went against the, the Armada from the point of view of the weather. And on the night of the 26th of October, they were driven in here into this little cove at a place called Lacada Point on the Causeway Coast. Lacada Point is very near uh, Dunluce Castle, the home of Sorley Boy MacDonald. It was an Irish chieftain who had a modicum of independence 
the, the English rule didn't really hold sway in his bailiwick. Uh, but I'll just go back there for a minute. They were driven in there uh, in the dark of night in a, an orderly gale, and uh, of the 1,500 people aboard, only six survived, and were taken in by sorry by MacDonald and ultimately repatriated, got into Scotland and repatriated to Spain. And they were able to give an account. There's, there's accounts of what happened in the Spanish archives uh, given by those six people. <clears throat> that's, that's the little cove there that the Girona drove into. Now, you're going to just imagine what it must have been like. Huge big waves crashing in there and the ship breaking up and that sorely by his Dunluce Castle. Magnificent structure if you're ever up there. I just diverge here for a moment. After all of the whole Armada thing died down, uh, the ships lay on the seabed and were forgotten about virtually, except in what is known in Irish as Bailidus. Word of mouth. Stories were handed down from generation to generation in families of the Armada. And the first man to take an interest in that in the late 19th century was this man here, William Spotswood Green, who was a Protestant minister of the church. He gave up his ministry and he became the chief inspector of fisheries for the Congested Districts Board. And he undertook tours of the whole of the West Coast in order to try and improve the lot of the fishermen to get survey the coast, to get little harbours built, uh, to get boats for the fishermen and get nets for them, to get lawns for them and so forth. And he did a wonderful amount of job. He was a well-known international mountaineer as well. In fact, that's not very well known about him. But he got really interested in it because he kept hearing all of these stories about the Spanish Armada that had been handed down from one generation to the next in families of fishermen that he spoke to. So he ultimately wrote a couple of papers on Armada wrecks on the Irish coast, which he delivered to the Royal Irish Academy and the uh, Royal Geographical Society. And they're very, very well worthwhile reading because a lot of the work of subsequent historians is based upon Spotswood Green's uh, work that he did. But the first discovery of an Armada wreck in Ireland was made by this man here, Robert Stenwey. Now, Stenwey was a Belgian diver archaeologist who had done archaeological work in various parts of the world, looking for ships, looking for treasure also, I might add. But he had a very, very uh, ethical archaeological approach to the whole thing also. Uh, he didn't want to just get artifacts for the sake of selling them. He wanted to be rewarded for what he found all right. Now, he could read all Spanish, and the documents are all, everything related to the Armada is housed in a place called Samancas Castle in Spain, in the Archivo del Indio. <clears throat> and he spent hours upon hours studying the documents in Samancas Castle. Uh, that's what the documents looked like. He learned to read old Spanish. Apparently, it's very difficult compared to modern Spanish, but he gleaned a lot of facts from that about where the various ships had been wrecked. So he gave them a, a peck and order with stars in order of preference, and he picked the Girona as the most likely one to look for. And he spent many hours looking for the Girona without finding it. Uh, in the course of that, he retraced the Leva steps from Kilturish down to Killybegs and around the, the north coast. And in the process, he found this cannon that had been left behind by the Spaniards when they departed from Kiltur. They had brought it with them from the wreck. And he published an article in the National Geographic, which I remember seeing at the time. Shortly afterwards, and this picture was in it, shortly after that, someone stole it. It disappeared. Nobody knows what happened to it. It may well be that the owner of the land might have took it and sold it, but it disappeared and nobody knows where it went. It was an iron cannon. Anyway, but uh, he wrote a wonderful book, which I have a copy of here, uh, Treasures of the Armada, written in French and it's translated into uh, English. A lovely book, a very, very fine book. And in it, he describes how him and his team, he had a team of guys with him, Belgians and French uh, divers and archaeologists, uh, how they spent something like 6,000 man-hours moving huge big boulders around that little site with airbags. Uh, and they found, the very first thing that they found on the site was a brass gun, bronze gun. There wasn't a trace of the ship, no trace of the timber structure of the ship at all. This site, in archaeological terms, is what's known as a high-energy site. That simply means that huge big waves be bashing in there during the winter and everything would be getting tossed around, including those big boulders. However, uh, he was very successful in doing that. And he spent a couple of seasons for several months each year doing that. That's fairly typical of the sort of visibility that there would have been. Well, it wouldn't have been all that great if there was any movement in the water. That's a stone cannonball. But they found a lot of uh, bronze guns. <laughs> they found metal objects, silver, bronze, and copper, and iron artifacts. But in addition to that, 
he found a collection of 1,256 gold, silver, and copper coins. That's some of them there. Some of these had been minted in, in Peru and uh, South American places like that. And he ultimately sold the coins and all of the other collection of jewellery and everything that he found to the Ulster Museum for the sum of £132,000. And that was a considerable amount of money uh, back in the early 60s. He was at this from about 1964. But he, was, he wanted everything to go into one particular place. And the Ulster Museum were delighted to get their hands on the stuff to start this great Armada collection. So everything, everything that he found went into the Ulster Museum. I'll show you a lot of the stuff we found later on. There's some of the, uh, the coins, pieces of eight, big doubloons, and a lot of the jewellery. I'll go through all that later on and show you some wonderful, wonderful artefacts. Now, while Stenway was operating in Antrim, there was another find being made on the opposite end of the country of another Armada vessel down in the Blasket Sound of a vessel called the Santa Maria della Rosa. There were already three ships at anchor in the Blasket Sound that had come in for shelter when the Santa Maria della Rosa came in. Now, Stenway had allocated five stars to this also because the Santa Maria della Rosa was reputed to be the, the pay ship of the Armada. There was a, reputed to be a lot of gold coins and, you know, silver, gold and silver coins on board and treasure and what have you. And that was one of the reasons why the man who organized the expedition uh, chose this. The other ships were anchored around about here under two very, very capable uh, admirals, Ricalde and uh, Aramburu. Now, one of those, Ricalde had been there before with a Spanish expedition that had uh, come in to, to help one of the Irish chieftains some years before, and he knew his way in, and he actually found, he piloted them in through the gap in between the islands. A very perilous passage, I might add. But the Santa Maria came in from this direction here, from the west, and cut across what was known as Stromboli Rock. It's a great big pinnacle of rock at the end of that line of reef of rocks running out there. It was called Stromboli Rock later on because it's a big pinnacle that came nearly to the surface, and it was run, uh, a warship called HMS Stromboli hit it and knocked the point off it. But that's why it's known as Stromboli Rock. But the Santa Maria della Rosa drove right in over that rock, and in front of the Royals, it no sooner had come in than it sank. In, it sank in a matter of minutes. And there was only one survivor from it who got ashore on a hatchboard or something like that, a young lad called Juan Antonio de Monona. I think he was a cabin boy or something, and he was captured and handed up to the English authorities. There's a very chilling sort of phrase that recurs regularly in the account of his interrogation. The prisoner was, much, was once again taken up and examined. Now, I'd hate to think what, what form the examination would have taken, because we don't know what happened to him after that. He disappeared from the record, so he was more than likely put to death, probably had been tortured. But I think he told the English what they wanted to hear, that there was great chests of gold and silver aboard this vessel, and great big guns, big brass guns. But there's a little bit of a mystery about the ship, because there's some evidence to say that another ship came into the Blasket Sound and sank also, called the San Juan. But the people who found the remains of this vessel were adamant that this was the Santa Maria della Rosa. So we just have to take that as read anyway. But there was, they didn't find any treasure or brass guns. Now, the man that organised it was the man in the middle there, a larger-than-life character who lived in North Wales called Sidney Wignall. Now, Sidney was a great adventurer, great character altogether. He, had, he was a diver and an explorer and a treasure hunter. And he was a mountaineer who climbed in the Himalayas. He'd been arrested by the Chinese and imprisoned for being a spy at one stage. He eventually let him out. So he was greatly interested and in, he had done various other wreck quests, that, you know, look for wrecks in various other parts of the world, fairly successfully at times. So he put an ad into various sporting magazines and diving magazines, looking for it to put a team together to explore the Blasket Sound to look for the Santa Maria della Rosa. Now, he was at pains to, to say in those ads that he put that this is not a treasure hunt. This is an archaeological project. But I think he did more than a bit of tongue-in-cheek uh, <laughs> in saying that. But uh, nevertheless, there were some very serious archaeologists joined with him. That's Colin Martin there of St. Andrews University, whom you'll frequently see on underwater archaeological projects on television. Alexander McKay, the man who found the Mary Rose. And that's the man kneeling beside Sydney there is Commander John Grattan, who's a descendant of the Irish patriot uh, Henry Grattan. He was a Royal Naval officer who was a mine clearance expert. He had cleared Malta Harbour of all of the bombs that had been dropped on it during the Second World War. 
And he used a method called the swim line search method to look for the bombs. And he used that method to search the blasted sound. I'll just tell you a little bit about that man there, the man in the dark jersey. His name is Carl Bjelvas. He was a diver with an interest in archaeology. Now, Carl told me something uh, at a seminar that I met him at in the Royal Marine Hotel years ago with, with our archaeological group. He told me that when this expedition petered out, they, they were there for several months for two years running. And when it petered out, when the money ran out and everybody was sort of pissed off and people were going home and Sydney uh, was very, very upset that they didn't really find a lot of treasure. And he had a lovely boat called the Jim Bell. It was a converted ship's lifeboat. And in a fit of high dudgeon, he put a hole in it and sank it. My good friend Desi Brannigan told me he was outraged that he was... Desi would have loved to have gotten his hands on it. However, when nearly everyone else had departed, Carl Bjelvas and his buddy decided to go over and have a look at a wreck called the Quebra. It was sunk in the First World War. Now, there was a lot of brass shell casings aboard it, and they took some of those. And he told me that on the very last part of the last dive that he discovered what was almost certainly another ballast wound. So either that could be either the San Juan, uh, which some people don't believe existed, or the be the Santa Maria della Rosa. He was to get back on to me and tell me uh, the location, but, but I never got back in touch with him again. They did do quite they, they ran a trench too. They found a ballast mound, but they didn't find any treasure or any guns. They found a lot of cannonballs. They found a lot of brass, uh, uh, lead musket balls and a few plates and things like that. Uh, and they did a few, they did, they did convey what they found onto paper. But I, I always felt this is a photograph that was given to me by Desi Brannigan, who was on the expedition, an Irish diver. And that that object in the foreground there was sort of indicative of the of archaeology that they were doing. This is the swim line search method that was set up by Commander Grattan. It entailed marking out the seabed with these moored, with these boils moored in, in a grid. And then a lot of guys would get on a rope uh, within sight of each other both ways. And you could search every inch of the seabed that way. And that's the way they cleared all the bombs off the seabed in Malta Harbour and the surrounds there. And they literally searched every inch of the blasket sound doing this swim line search. When they'd get up as far as there, uh, they'd surface and the next crowd would go down and they'd move on to the next set of boils. They'd be going along on a compass bearing mostly. But those are the swim line search patterns that were swam by Grattan's crowd, and they literally left it till the last, the very last search. They found it, on, obviously, uh, they found it on the last one, but they had, they had done all of these searches before they actually did Stromboli Rock, and they found the ballast mound over there. They didn't find anything near the Quebra, because I don't think they actually hit where the Quebra was. It was just outside the line of their search, according to Carl. A couple of photographs given to me by Desi Brannigan. Uh, the the Blasket Sound can be a notorious place. The wreck the ballast mound that they found is at about 30 metres, which is fairly deep now in diving terms. You don't have a lot of time to work down there. Maximum, you'd have about 20 minutes, to 20 to 30 minutes. And after that, you'd have to do decompression stops. But there's a fierce tidal run at times through it, and the weather can change very dramatically. Uh, that was them going out to the, the wreck, and that was it coming back after the, the day's diving. A couple of drawings shown the positions of the various artefacts that they found and some of the timber elements that they found. They found two things that convinced them that it was the Santa Maria della Rosa that they found. One was a plate with a name on it, which I'll show you in a moment. And the other was they were able to uncover the mast step. And they found that it had been, they saw where it had been repaired. And it was a record in the Spanish archives of the fact that a repair had been carried out to the mast step on the Santa Maria della Rosa. There's another of Sydney's drawings. They ran a trench through here, through the ballast mound. And there's some of the timbers that were uncovered. Very disconsolate looking Sydney there in the centre, with John Grattan on the right and Colin Martin uh, on the left. Colin went on to become the director of the, the Archaeological Marine Institute in St Andrews University. And uh, he was involved in various other armada wreck excavations also. Sydney went off to do other things at any rate. So you can see there some of the artefacts. They found cannonballs and lead shot. There's a load of that lead shot in the museum, our museum here, given them by Desi Brannigan, who'd held on to some of them. But rival divers appeared on the site and wanted to dive there, and they were run off by Sydney and his crowd. And they had to go to the High Court to get a barring order against them because they had laid claim to the wreck under the Merchant Shipping Act, salvage aspects of the Merchant Shipping Act, which has nothing at all to do with archaeological law. If you found, if you found something underwater back then, even of an archaeological nature, you could lay, lay claim to it as, as what was known as salver in possession. 
So it was, it was framed for the furtherance of commerce now rather than archaeology, but they found this pewter plate with the name Machute on it. And it was known from the, the records that there was a captain of infantry aboard the Santa Maria de la Rosa by the name of Machute. So they were able to vindicate their claim to the ship in the high court and they got the barring order against the other divers. Now, after that had petered out, the next discovery didn't occur till about 1972, I think. So we have 71 up in Kinigo Bay on the Inishon Peninsula of a wreck called the Trinidad Valencera. Now, the Trinidad Valencera was one of the biggest ships in the Armada. It was a converted Venetian war, uh, merchant ship that had been converted into a warship by having extra gun ports put into it. Now, that may have contributed to its sinking, but it, it had also got a hammering down in the channel, in the battles of Gravelin and in the channel. And it was in a sinking condition when it came in here. It sprang a very bad leak coming around the north of Scotland. And they managed to limp into here, into Kinigo Bay at Glenagivney. And the bow of the ship ran up on a reef and the stern of the ship settled down on the sandy bottom. And most of the crew were taken off by some of the local, uh, they were described again as the local savages. Uh, the the, the O'Doherty clan uh, ruled that part of Ireland at the time. But all of a sudden then, uh, after a couple of days, there were still 40 people aboard when the ship broke up and sank and 40 people were drowned. But the rest of them had gotten off successfully. Now, it was the Derry Subacqua Club who discovered the wreck of the Trinidad Valenstera. And they did all of their Sunday training up here on the Inishon Peninsula. Uh, they brought their trainees up here to give them their first dives. And it's a nice place to dive, actually, because some good underwater scenery. But most of their efforts were concentrated down at the far end down at the eastern end of Kinigo Bay, because that is reputedly where the Trinidad Balancera had sunk. Now, they were, a, they were a very, very responsible, knowledgeable, and archaeologically uh, aware bunch of guys uh, in the Dirty Tobacco Club at the time. And it was always this thing in the back of their mind, while you're on the dive, keep your eye out for the Trinidad Balancera. But they had been diving down at the far end for years and never thought to come up this end. So one Sunday morning, then they just decided to dive on the western end of Kinigo Bay, and lo and behold, they found, first thing they found was a brass cannon. So they discovered that that was the, the position of the wreck, and it's a very sandy bottom there, and there was a huge amount of gear down below, uh, including some of the ship's timbers, down below a, a, a great overburden of sand. But there was some stuff lying on the surface, all right, in the rocky areas, literally not far off the shore, just behind that bush there, where the wreck came in. So the Derry, the city of Derry Subacqua Club decided that a full-scale archaeological archaeological project would have to be carried out on it and that anything was found would have to be kept together and conserved and put on display in a museum somewhere. So they approached the Irish authorities and the Irish authorities had no interest whatsoever. They hadn't got any money whatsoever to do conservation work. They gave them the imprimatur okay to go ahead, do the project. But it was arranged then that the Ulster Museum would take in all of the artefacts that were found. And that's what ultimately happened. So they organised a marvellous thing. For a bunch of amateurs, uh, they organised a wonderful project over a series of about two or three years, I think. And there's a fantastic film made by the Chronicle, the BBC Chronicle team about the excavation of the Trinidad Balancera. It's narrated by Magnus Magnusson, who is an archaeologist himself. And you'll find that on YouTube. If you just put in Trinidad Valencera, Magnus Magnusson, you'll find that film. And it's a magnificent film all about the whole of the excavation. They gridded off the whole area and they organised water dredges and air dredges and everything else and got everything uh, into conservation mode and delivered up to uh, Queen's University, first of all, and then to from there to uh, the Ulster Museum. Uh, that's some of them there. I, I, I knew some of them. Ernie Green was a great guy. He partly passed away a while ago. He became a commercial diver. But uh, they were a very, very responsible bunch of guys. One of the things that they found, first of all, was this great cannon. Now, this is not a naval cannon. It's a, a land cannon. It's a siege gun. It was a, the, the Spaniards... The land army of the Spaniards, had the, well, they were great at siege warfare, were very experienced and proficient at that. This would have been used to batter down, you know, big, great, big uh, fortification walls and so forth. Now, there were three of these recovered off the Trinidad Valencera. This fired a 50-pound ball, massive guns. Now, this one is in the Tower Museum in Derry. And I'm sure if you look at that, you'll agree the size matters. That's nearly, the, the, the wheel, and that's nearly six foot high. And the wheels were made by the, the shipwrights in Chatham Dockyard. 
they were copied from some of the wheels that were found on the seabed. The original gun carriage wheels uh, were there on the seabed and were recovered. And it's a magnificent piece, I'm sure you'll agree. Uh, that's the Tower Museum there. Uh, one of the deals that was made with the Irish government was that a museum would be built to house some of the Armada artefacts that were recovered. And this is what ensued from it. Now, there's a, it's a hugely interesting place because there's not only Armada artefacts in it. It's a lovely museum and well worth a visit in Derry if you're ever up there. That's a picture of one of the wheels of the, gun, the, the great big siege gun carriage. Uh, several, uh, several of the ships uh, that were discovered are in the Armada had these siege trains guns and equipment aboard. That's the escutcheon that I showed you earlier on off one of those big siege guns that it was picked out with all the nice colours showing the combined arms of Spain and England. I'll just tell you something about the crew. I don't want to, I wasn't going to include this, but I don't, I don't want to go too much over the time. But uh, the crew of the Trinidad Balancera decided that they'd try and get over. They knew about Sorley by McDonald in his fastness over in, on the Causeway Coast in Dunluce Castle. And they decided they'd head for there to try and make a break for there. So they banded together. They were fairly well armed, a good bunch of them. And they set off south away from Derry to try and get a place to cross the file. And near a, a village called Alia, they were surrounded by a big horde of armed horsemen who were Irish mercenaries in the pay of the English. They were like something like the condottieri in, uh, that operate on the continent. They were private mercenary armies who would hire out to anybody who was willing to pay them. And some of them were actually re related to the great O'Neill. They were under the command of the brothers Hovindam. Uh, they, were, they were surrounded anyway, and they were prevailed upon to uh, lay down their arms in return for safe passage over to Sorley by MacDonald. So as soon as they laid down their arms, the officers were separated out and kept in a separate group. And all of the other men were herded into a field and stripped naked of all their possessions. And then the armed horsemen tore into them with muskets and pikes and swords and everything else and slaughtered the load of them. And some of them managed to escape or run into a bog. And some of them actually managed to get over to Dunluce Castle and were, were repatriated through neutral Scotland. It was a dreadful breach of faith altogether. Because at this stage, greed had more or less overcome the initial order that, the Span that all the Spaniards were to be slaughtered. So the general rule of war was anybody who could afford to be ransomed was spared and kept prisoner until such time as a ransom could be sent for you. And that's what happened with the officers here. They were marched to Dublin via Drogheda and a few other places like that in Dundalk. And they were held prisoner there and they were, gone, they were being sent over to London to be held for ransom. And a small vessel called a Swallow was hired from a man called Christopher Carreal, who was the constable of Carrick Fergus Castle. Now, this information didn't come to light from the English archives until quite recently. And it wasn't known to most historians who have written about the Armada. On the way across the Irish Sea, the Spaniards took over the ship. They overpowered the guards and the crew. And they took the ship down to Spain and got back to Spain successfully. Captain Carreal petitioned the Privy Council to get to get the price of a ship back, a little ship called the Swallow. It was in an all make at £173, six and eightpence, <laughs> which some the said Captain humbly desired to have restored unto him, and also that some of the reserved prisoners, who, which remain undelivered at this time, may also be detained to the redemption of the said captain's men, so carried away as aforesaid. Some of the crew were again, like Drake's crew, put on trial to, uh, to recant their faith and they were dealt with in the same way as Drake's men had been. The Inquisition was in full flight at that stage in Spain. Well, to show you some of the artefacts now that were found on the Trinidad Valencia and on the various other wrecks as well. That's a, a swivel gun, a Venetian swivel gun. It was known in Spanish as un asesino veneciano, a Venetian murderer, <laughs> it was known as. These were uh, perfect for the type of warfare that the Spaniards indulged in. You could mount this on the rail of the ship, and it was breech loading. That's the breech block there that slotted in there, and it was held in with a, a wooden wedge covered in leather. And when the gun was found on the Trinidad Valencia, it had a loaded breech block in it ready to be fired. Uh, you could load this with anything you liked, with a, a, with a single ball, with a whole lot of lead balls. You could lo load it with broken glass or nails or bits of iron, anything. And it would do dreadful devastation to the defenders of a ship when you were going alongside. If several of these were mounted on your own rail. But another reason why it was called a Venetian murderer was there was a great big long tiller bar on the back of it, which the gunner held. And sometimes if there was too great a charge in the breech block, the gun would kick out of the gunner's hand and take the head off the, the guy next to him in the gun crew. These are all items concerned with gunnery. 
These were all on the Trinidad Balancera also. A leather powder bucket with a uh, copper handle. You couldn't have anything steel or iron near gunpowder. A wooden rammer for ramming the ball down the barrel of the cannon. A copper powder scoop. A whole lot of different sized cannonballs in iron and in stone. Many of the, the cannonballs were of stone back then. They were cheaper to manufacture. And sometimes when they would burst, some of them were made of marble. When they'd burst, and they'd, they'd be like, literally like shrapnel. When they hit something, they'd be like shrapnel flying about. But you can see here that there's a load of these shot gauges. These were very essential because there was no standardization of the guns on the Armada. They were cobbled in, brought in from all over the Spanish Empire. And they were of all sizes and all sorts of gauges. So you had to have a gauge to make sure, a gauge for the particular gun that you were loading to make sure that the ball was going to fit down the barrel. The wooden thing in the foreground is called a linstock. Now that held a smoldering match, a smoldering piece of rope that had, uh, you know, like oil on it. And that was for touching off the powder in the touch hole to set off the charge. These are navigational instruments, <clears throat> instruments, sounding leads. These were still on ships when I was at sea, carried as an, uh, just as an emergency piece of kit. If everything else failed, you could find out at least what depth you were in. And even then, in my day, they still had the hollow in the bottom of them that you could fill with tallow. And to pick up a sample of the seabed, it would be marked on the chart what the nature of the seabed was. A piece of an astrolabe, which was the forerunner of a sextant for determining the altitude of the sun. A mariner's dividers and the base of a compass with the pivot on it. That said, a piece of the eroded astrolabe that was found. But that's what they would have looked like there. You literally just looked through two holes at the sun and read off uh, the altitude of it and find your latitude mostly. And as I say, it was a forerunner of quadrants and sextants. A lot of uh, mariners dividers, so a good few of these found, which signified the fact that they would have had a lot of charts, no matter how, <laughs> how bad they were, how inaccurately they showed the coastline. Now, this is one of the most iconic uh, images or items associated with the Armada that was found on the Girona. It's a little gold salamander pendant set with rubies. And I was absolutely astounded when I saw that. I first saw it in the National Geographic magazine, that uh, the article Sten we wrote. And I think it's become very iconic. I was rather disappointed when I saw it because it's very small. I'd always imagined it was much bigger. It's, about, it's only about 50 centimetres or 50 millimetres long. It's a beautiful object, nevertheless. There was quite a lot of these, what are known as money chains, found. Some of these are over two metres long, two and a half metres long, and they were carried by the nobility. Maybe they wore them around their neck, I don't know, but they, they had open links on them, most of them, that you could actually, if you wanted to buy something and you hadn't got any coin, you could open a link and exchange it for goods or services. Quite a few of them found. These are three knight's crosses that were found on the Girona. Uh, the top one on the left is the knight the Order of Alcantara. The one on the bottom is the Order of Santiago de Compostela, St. James. Uh, the motif is actually a sword and a cross combined. And it's reckoned that this was belonged to Alonso de Leva, because he was a member of the uh, of that particular knightly order, the Order of Santiago. I don't know what the one on top, I think that's just a, a gold medal. But the one in the middle is the best known one, because that's the cross of the Order of St. John of Jerusalem, Rhodes and Malta, the Knights of Malta. Now, anybody, everybody who was anybody in the nobility of Europe at the time was in the Knights of Malta. Uh, the Knights were at the height of their fame and martial prowess at the time. They owned the island of Malta and they were a military order who preyed on Muslim shipping. They had a, a fleet of ships and they preyed on Muslim uh, commerce and Muslim shipping and enslaved all the Muslims to get them to row their galleys, what have you. It was a real gentleman's club. And they had withstood an enormous siege from the Turks from the, uh, under Suleiman the Magnificent in 1565 uh, that lasted three months. And they successfully withstood that. And they became famous throughout Europe. And all of the nobility of Europe flocked to join the Knights of Malta. You had to do a two-year stint on the galleys, chasing the, the Muslims up and down the Mediterranean. And you had to be available whenever you were called upon to carry out warfare. Uh, on the Muslims or whatever. It's quite a big cross. I've seen some of these in Malta. Uh, beautiful artifact with white enamel. It's about three inches by three inches. I'll just show you that there. So then we found these to three elements of this down in among the gravel and the sand in the little cove at Lakada Point. We found the cross first of all. Then he found the, the, the link up on top here. And amazingly, he found the tip off the cross. 
in among the gravel and the sand. How he managed that, I don't know. There's still a trace of the white enamel on that. That's the cross of Alcantara and Santiago. Uh, this was part of a chain that would have gone, an, an ornate jeweled chain that would have gone around in a series of links that looked like that. But they only found one of them. Uh, heaven knows where the rest of them were. Gold buttons. I think the, uh, the likes of this signify the fact that the, all of the officers of the, uh, the ships and of the army would have been uh, you know, of the nobility. And they brought their good gear with them. <laughs> they reckoned they were going to prevail in the invasion of England and they would have been strutting around London wearing all their, their gold buttons and their finery and what have you. But these are some of the, uh, the jewellery and gold objects found by, by Stenwy up on the Girona. That, that up there is an actual chain made up of these cameos of lapis lazuli to show Eastern Roman emperors. Now, this is actually depicted around some no, nobleman's neck in a painting in the Prado, I think. So they were able to identify who all these Roman emperors were. It's set with pearls also. An amazing find. There were quite a lot of rings found. That's a bishop's ring there with a the motif of IHS in hoc signo on it. Quite a good few rings found. This is a little ring set with a diamond. But I think the next one is probably what I know. That's the gold salamander. Now, it's a bit of a mystery about that. I'm not too sure what that represents. I think it has some religious significance. Because the, the, the salamander motif is on some of the other artifacts that were found. Uh, so I'm, I'm not sure what the significant, significance of that is. I'll have to look that up and find that out. Uh, there's, there's, a, there's a salamander motif on that ring. But the next one here, this... I think this is one of the most beautiful objects found throughout all of the wrecks. It's a lover's ring. with The, the motif on it is a heart held in a hand. And there's obviously a, a present between departing lovers. The, uh, the, the inscription around uh, the band on the outside states, No tengo mas que darte. But that means in, in English, I have nothing more to give you. Uh, reduced my poor wife to tears when we saw it up in the Ulster Museum. You can actually buy replicas of that up in the museum. This is an amazing find from the Trinidad Balancera. It's a Ming porcelain bowl. Now, this would have been extremely scarce stuff uh, on the continent of Europe, originating in China. Uh, the Span Spaniards were already out in the Far East at this stage in the Philippines, and this would have been traded from China uh, to the Philippines and back to Europe, and it would have been very highly regarded. It would have been a, a rather a phenomenon. For, as I say, porcelain was totally unknown, and it managed to remain intact, buried in the sand in Kinigo Bay. Uh, I think it's very poignant to find the ordinary, everyday artefacts of life. And there's a huge amount of this sort of stuff uh, in the Ulster Museum that was found. I'm just going to show you a few examples here. But when a ship like that sinks with all of this stuff aboard, it's a virtual time capsule and it gives you a great insight into what life was like at that particular point in time. That would have been an olive jar, uh, a wooden bowl and a wooden spoon, a horn beaker. It's an earthenware plate and an earthenware jug. There was also a Brazil nut and a pine cone found in among all that stuff there. But if you ever see the stuff found on the Mary Rose or on the Vasa up in Stockholm, it literally tells of him and tells of artifacts like this that belong to all of those people on board. And it's really wonderful display uh, to see any of those. This is a mortar and pestle that would have been used for either spices or for medicinal purposes. Some more officers gear, the, the, the Ming say the Ming ball, uh, silver candlesticks and pewter plates and jugs and cups. The, some domestic history was rewritten when, these, when some of these finds were found. Because it wasn't known, it wasn't thought that forks were in general use at this time. But nevertheless, a great many forks were found. So as I say, that has rewritten some domestic history. A bellows. The cooking would have been done over an open fire on bricks. Uh, I'm almost sure there was one of these in my mother's house when I was a child, almost identical to that. There's a common theme between these objects here. It has to do with uh, cleanliness, or rather lack of cleanliness, because there wouldn't have been an awful lot of water available uh, to wash yourself or your clothes aboard these tightly packed vessels. And the thing on top is a, a fine comb made of bone or ivory, I'm not sure which, for getting rid of unwanted travellers, <laughs> unwanted guests in your hair. Uh, the little vial is a perfume vial with a glass stopper on it. Everybody would have been very smelly back then, and your clothes would have stank to high heaven also from not being washed. So everybody would have had moustaches and whiskers. So any of the gentry that had one of these would have taken it out and dabbed a bit of perfume around the whiskers so he wouldn't be able to smell his own clothes or his neighbours. Well, 
Uh, the other thing there is a gold ear spoon for taking the wax out of your ears. Now, it was known what that was because there are other ones in existence. It's an elephant's head and the trunk extended out uh, a few inches with a spoon on the end of it for taking the wax out of your ears. There's your, your perfume foil with the little glass stopper and the elephant's head with the spoon bent back on it. There was a huge amount of organic material found on the Trinidad Balancera particularly. Organic material like cloth and leather lasts very well once it's down in a, in a wet anaerobic environment, like down in mud or in sand. And it lasted very well. And a lot of that has been conserved. It's on display. A leather shoe. These are some of the forks that I said rewrote some of the domestic history of the time. Silver forks. I'd say everyone else would have been used to picking the stuff up with their hands and eating it. A silver crucifix, uh, very modern, modernistic looking, but something that has just eroded away. And I think that's that uh, gold medal with the head of Christ depicted on it. This was one of a pair of cruet lids. A would have been on one of them and V on the, on the other one, aqua and vino, to hold the, the water and the wine for the Blessed Sacrament at the Mass. Silver. Now, I don't know whether the other one was found or not, but that's just one of them anyway. Uh, this is a little gold box that would have belonged to a clergyman. There were quite a lot of clergymen aboard the, vessel, the Armada vessels, Spanish priests and bishops, even some English ones and Irish ones also, who were hoping to be uh, repatriated, who had to leave the country perhaps. There's little uh, round holes in the, uh, the, in the inside of this that held round wax tablets from the Paschal candles that probably would have been used for anointing people. I think they're called Agnes Day, Lambs of God. But that's a beautiful little object, that little hinged box. Now, this is Lawrence Flanagan, a lovely, kind, gentle, generous-hearted man who was the curator of the Ulster Museum and who was responsible for taking in all of the material. He gave us a, a couple of lectures in the archaeological group that I was with some years ago, and it's a good few years ago, in fact. Uh, he told us that there was a perception abroad that there was unlimited funds available to the British Museum and the Ulster Museum to conserve the objects that were brought in from the Trinidad Valenciera particularly. But he said that wasn't so, and that he had to personally undertake lecture tours in America of American universities to raise money. And so that he was a lovely, generous-hearted man, but he was murdered in his house by two burglars who broke in and hit him on the head and murdered him. Dreadful, dreadful thing to have happen. I imagine they probably thought that he might have had some valuable artefacts in there from some of the Armada wrecks. Dreadful tragedy altogether. Lovely man. Uh, in the aftermath of the Armada, Elizabeth uh, and various English nobles had medals struck commemorating the Armada. They all have the one same message, variations of it. God breathed and they were scattered. The winds of God blew and we were saved. And some of them mentioned the Protestant wind. They were all very quick to invoke the deity on their own side, of course. There's another one there. This is uh, known as an, an Armada table. It was in Dromolan Castle in Clare, and it's now in the County Museum in Ennis. And it's reputed to have come from an Armada ship. Now, I don't think that the rails and the top would have come from an Armada ship, because I think they're of a later date. That's our beautiful uh, Killarney wood inlaying on the rails there. But the... Carved oak uprights there on it almost certainly would have come from one of the Armada ships because if, if you look at the stern of the Vasa in Stockholm, there's a whole lot of carvings very similar to this. A lot of the state warships of the day would have been adorned with these carvings, probably gilded to give them a sense of magnificence, to portray the magnificence uh, of the state. That's a, uh, a wooden, another wooden carving that's in the Franciscan Museum up in Donegal. I've never actually seen it. I've just seen this photograph of it. There's quite a lot of these Armada chests around. They've become, to, become known as that. But I don't actually think any of them actually came from Armada ships. They were very, very heavy. They were just strong boxes and chests of their day that were used to hold various funds. This one is actually in Christchurch Cathedral. There's one in Kilkenny Cathedral as well. But the last, most recent vessels to be found were three Armada ships up in Strida Strand in Sligo. It was known that they were there because this map existed in the British archives of where the ships actually are on just off Street of Strand. Three of the ships tried to shelter in the Lee of Inish Murray over here. That island, that street of there, that, that peninsula there is, is actually Street. Of. It's a bit like the Bull Island and Dolly Mount, but the sea comes in behind it. And it's a very, very shallow, sandy area outside that. You have to go out a good distance to get any depth. It's only from five to ten metres out to about there. The three ships sheltered in the Lee of Inish Murray. The, the westerly gales continued and they were literally, the anchors that they had were insufficient and they didn't hold. They were washed in and embayed on that sandy area and they broke up. 
The name of the three ships were the La Lavia, the Giuliana, and the Santa Maria della Vision. Now, in 1984, I think, a group of divers came over from England. They were fairly wealthy guys who had great equipment. They had big ribs and great detection equipment. And they came over to look for these uh, vessels. And in one swipe up and down the beach, they found them. That's three of the strand there. And it's literally only about a half a mile out there where the three ships were wrecked. And they cover an area of about a square kilometer. And the seabed is literally paved, covered with artifacts out there. Very few people survived the wrecks. A lot of the people uh, did, did get to the shore, and some of them were cut down by a, a, bunch, a bunch of armed English horsemen. And any, any, any who, who didn't suffer that fate were stripped naked and left on the shore with the local savages. But there's a wonderful account of the wrecking of the three ships here on Street of Strand, given by a man called Francisco de Quelar. Uh, he was a captain uh, who was on board one of the ships, and he managed to come in on a, a piece of wreckage, and he survived. Now, he got a, a slash from a sabre from one of those mounted horsemen, but he managed to survive. He was stripped naked also of all his possessions, by some of whom he describes as the local savages. De Quelar was apparently a very handsome guy, and he was sheltered by some of the Irish women in the tribes that he came across. <laughs> And he managed ultimately to get back to Scotland, uh, to, up to Sorley by MacDonald up in Dunluce and got back to Scotland. He was shipwrecked on his way back there he, on, the, on the coast of, uh, of Belgium near Antwerp, but he did manage to get back to Spain. And he wrote down all his reminiscences of what happened to him uh, at Strida. And it was translated from Spanish into English uh, by a man called Hugh Allingham. And it was republished by Sligo County Council in in 1988. But uh, it's a, a fantastic account. It's, it's, it's a wonderful social document that describes the lives of the Irish people and how wild they were. He refers to them throughout as the, the, the local savages and how they were being predated upon by, by the English. And actually, hor- horrendous conditions that most of them were actually living in. He also describes wolves eating the bodies on the shore. They were washed in. Well, so it's, if you can get your hands on a copy of this, it's probably fairly scarce by now. It's, it's, a, it's a wonderful social document, well worth reading. Now, the English divers that came over, they called themselves the Strida Group. They laid claim to the wrecks under the Merchant Shipping Act and Salvers in possession. But at that time, the National Monuments Act, it does it come up to 1967 now at this stage? The National Monuments Amendment Act was being framed at the time, which vested ownership of all such wrecks that were over 100 years old in the state. So the state put a, a barring order on them, and which they they, contest, they brought that to the High Court and contested it. In the meantime, the 1967 legislation was passed, and a whole lot of court cases ensued for the divers to try and they were trying to vindicate their claim to the wrecks as salvers in possession. But ultimately, in the in the final big court case in the High Court, Mr. Justice Barr decided that the wrecks had passed out of out of commercial law and into archaeological law long before they were found in Strida. Now, the legislation provides for a discretionary award to be given, and I don't know whether uh, the lads got a discretionary award or not. There are two schools of thought in government circles with regard to discretionary awards. It's different from the situation in England. One school that says that rewards should be kept small to discourage you from looking for artefacts, and the other school says that they should be very generous to encourage you to hand up stuff. A group from our archaeological group, UART, the Irish Underwater Archaeological Research Team, that was formed to uh, to assist the government and the Office of Public Works in investigating matters like this. A very knowledgeable and capable bunch of amateurs in the group, uh, mostly divers, uh, who were very archaeologically aware. It was just an interim thing, really, uh, until such time as a professional group of underwater government, underwater archaeologists could be put together. And this is Kevin Crothers, my late friend, that went up. He, he was one of the people that went up there yeah. to have a look around, and he's taken photographs there. We managed to get a loan of one of the cannons that was raised by the group in, in their effort to vindicate their claim. But their claim was, was stood down and refused anyway. And as I said, I don't know what the, the outcome was. But we had the cannon in the Maritime Museum for a good length of time. That's Kevin there. And you can see there that the cannon, you can see the ball down in the barrel. It was loaded. Kevin was a staunch member of the museum, and we had it in this tank on display for a good while in water, which was probably the best thing for it until it was properly conserved. But it was repossessed by the uh, the National Museum, and it's now in the foyer of Collins Barracks, along with some other Armada guns, including one of those great big siege guns. I offered to make uh, a, a gun carriage for this gun. <laughs> I never got a reply. <laughs> It would have been a real labour of love. 
So, uh, I'll just finish off with a few more slides. Here. Now, some of you might have met Connie Kelleher in a wonderful lecture she gave recently about piracy on the south coast of Ireland uh, in bygone centuries. And uh, she's written a wonderful book about it. Now, Connie was excavating a wreck up off Aaron Moore in a little island called Rutland Island on a small vessel that was reputed to be from the Armada era. Now, it had been dived extensively before and a lot of artefacts were taken off it. But I don't know whether she's finished up there or not. Connie is one of the government underwater archaeolog archaeological team. This is a man called Don Luis Horishategui Santos, who gave us a lecture at a seminar we had up in Grange in County Sligo, an Armada seminar about an event that took place after the Armada in the year after it. He called it La Contra Armada, the Counter Armada. <laughs> and he wrote a wonderful book about it, but unfortunately at the time it was in Spanish, but it's since been translated into English. The Counter Armada was a, uh, an event similar to the Spanish Armada that was got up by the English under Drake to invade La Coruña, to take over La Coruña as an English possession. And it was a miserable failure. And knowledge of that failure was suppressed by Walsingham and Elizabeth Spymaster and the authorities. And they didn't want it getting out because England was on a kind of a high after the defeat of the Spanish Armada. And they didn't want it getting out that their Armada had failed miserably. So it was really lost to history. And the they Drake actually lost more ships and more men than the Spaniards had in their armada in his attempt to take Coruña. This is a statue of a lady called Maria Pitta, who's greatly revered there. Apparently at, at one stage during the uh, the fighting, a breach appeared in the defences and it was about to be stormed by Drake's men. And Maria P Pitta picked up a spear and led the counter charge and repulsed the English attack. And there's a statue to her in uh, La Coruña, greatly revered. I think she might have been the inspiration for Marianne. Uh, the great French heroine of the French Revolution later on. That's Connie Kelleher that I showed you earlier on, and Carl Brady, who are the two main divers uh, with the underwater archaeological group. And in recent times, they decided to take, the government uh, decided to take up, whatever government department they're attached to, decided to take up some more of the cannons off the seabed in Strida. But they, there's no way in the world that the Irish government would ever be able to afford to take everything up off the seabed there, as it would cost untold billions to conserve. Conservation is very costly business. And I think they take the view that as all the stuff has lain on the seabed for 400 years, it can lay there for a little while longer until such time as they get the money uh, to do the conservation work. But nevertheless, a good many more guns have been taken up recently. Fascinating motifs. I forget now what that the meaning of that one there is to do with some saint or other. Another pair of those siege gun wheels just lying on the seabed. That's the vessel used. That's Finn Barmore in the middle there, the man who's in charge of the underwater archaeological group. Wonderful looking gun, that. A great big pot. I think it's a cooking pot, a great big bronze cooking pot. I think that was taken up also. But this is the last slide you'll be glad to hear. It's just to show you uh, my own collection of Armada books that have assembled over the years because I've had a great interest in it back since the 70s, actually, since I saw uh, Magnus Magnuson's wonderful program. I was already aware of it at that time, but I took a great interest in it ever since. And one of the best of them, if you're ever thinking, of, a lot of them are probably scarce now. The Armada in Ireland, the one here on the bottom right, was written by a journalist, an Irish journalist called Neil Fallon, who did a huge amount of investigative work. And by a process of elimination, he worked out where most of the vessels would have been wrecked on the West Coast and elsewhere. Ireland, the graveyard of the Spanish Armada was by a journalist uh, called Kilfeather who worked for the Kerryman. And he's one of the few authors who mentioned the San Juan, the uh, the second vessel in the in the Blasket Sound. That's Lawrence Flanagan's books, Colin Martin. And this is a catalogue of all of the artefacts that were put on display in Ulster and in the Maritime Museum in Greenwich of artefacts of the Spanish Armada period. Great book by a fabulous marine author called Ernold Bradford, who was a, a wonderful author altogether, with a lot of information about Drake and his activities there. Uh, that's Stenway's book there, Treasures of the Armada. That's a wonderful book, actually. And that's Sidney Wignall's book there, In Search of Spanish Treasure, that deals with the Blasket Sound expedition and with a whole lot of his other expeditions also. So I think just to finish off to say about the Spanish Armada, uh, I think it was one of the great potential turning points, crossroads in world history. The history of the world could very easily have been uh, written in a totally different way had certain circumstances not just prevailed, had 
the wind's not been so strong westerly. Uh, had the wind changed and blown <laughs> easterly and blown the fire ships back in among the English fleet, if Parma had had his his fleet of small boats ready to, to bring his, his army of Flanders out aboard the Spanish fleet, and if perhaps they had somebody a bit more resolute in charge other than the Duke of Medina Sidonia, I think it's a, a salutary lesson that how the history of the world can be decided by a few puffs of wind. So thank you very much. Cormac, that, that was an excellent talk and... Uh... We all knew a lot about the, well, we thought we knew a lot about the Spanish Armada, but you've really put the icing on the cake. We now look on it with a, a, a different light. Uh, I wouldn't like to be in touch with those savages from Sligo at any stage. <laughs> <laughs> we have, we have you, one you Mark, them, would appreciate that. We have one of them as a member, and I think one is enough for, for any association. <laughs> so uh, I think we'll It, it may have lost something in the translation, Johnny. But I, I definitely call them the local savages, so. and he wasn't the only one to call them that. Uh, I, I, w- I wouldn't think so. Uh, uh, but he describes the, 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 the rough clothing that they wore and the, the rough manners of eating and living. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. I, don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think it was the wolves that were going on the beach <laughs> eating the sailors. <laughs> yeah, still a lot of wolves in the country at the time, and yeah. you saw wolves eating the bodies on the you know, I'm just thinking of this Spanish arch in Galway, so there was a Spanish link between Galway and Spain going back through the centuries back. And Columbus is supposed to have called into Galway as yeah. well. Well, there's no proof that... Not Michael, it's, that. it's a well-known historical fact that there was a huge trade going on between Galway and Spain before this period. In addition to that, it was a, a place for the importation of wine to serve the, the, the rest of the country from Spain. In addition to that, there was a huge Spanish fleet of fishing vessels, fishing the the... the the waters offshore on the west coast are relatively shallow compared to the, the rest of the Atlantic. And the banks over there that had wonderful fishing on them for hake and ling and cod and what have you. And the Spaniards had been coming up there for quite a long number of years. So there would have been a great interchange between Spain and Galway anyway, hence the, the Spanish arch. There's all kinds of stories about uh, people on the west of Ireland being descended from... Uh, people who were left behind by the Spanish Armada, but I don't think that there would have been enough of them to, to uh, dilute the gene pool down to that extent. <laughs> Undoubtedly, there are some uh, descendants of did, people. Did any of the Armada try to get into Galway then? They would, I'm surely the Armada... No, not, not into the city itself. Uh, would that have been too risky then? Ah, yeah. No, the, 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 that would have been a stronghold of the English at the time. Yeah, yeah. City, yeah. Is there any truth in the black Irish notion... Has anyone, uh, what, what you suggest that there probably wasn't a significant injection? Of- uh, let, let me tell you this, Ed. My, my former next door neighbor looked like a Spaniard. Yeah. And his father was from the Rosses in Donegal. Yeah. And his name was Long. Yeah. Now, this, the Irish word for the ship is Long. <laughs> there you go. And he always reckoned that his father said that he was descended from Spaniards. And okay. Brian looks like a Spaniard, and his kids look even more Spanish. So there might well be some truth in it, all right. They could definitely, some of them actually live in Spain now, and they pass for Spaniards, no bother. No. I remember being met by a, um, a customs officer at Dunmore East in 1978 or something, who looked like we were taken straight to the Mediterranean. He, 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 was, he, he even had a medallion around his neck. It was, it was like, ah! <laughs> that was yeah, yeah. shining. <laughs> I'll have to tell you another story about uh, the, the diving club I was with. Uh, it was one of my favourite Armada stories, just very briefly. Our diving club went down to County Clare for a long weekend of diving. And we were diving near Lisconnor. And we weren't particularly looking for Armada vessels because the diving just off the coast where we were, we were about a half a mile offshore in, a, in little inflatable boats. And the diving, the underwater scenery was magnificent. It was a whole lot of gullies. Uh, with walls on either side, teeming with life, and you can go from one end to the other. There was Armada wrecks, had, uh, there was Armada ships had been wrecked down along there. So the watchword was, just keep your eye out. So on one particular dive, I was on the first group that went in, there was six of us, three of us went down, and the other three in the boat. So when we came up, I was on the, I, I, I was driving the boat, and we were tracking the other three guys who were down below. We could, you could see their bubbles, it was very calm. And, I knew when, when it came time to come up, you can see the pattern of the bubbles changed. So I was ready for them to come up. And the first thing I saw coming out of the water was a hand. You always come up with your hand up anyway. And it was holding what looked like a huge big chalice. 
And I said, oh, my Jesus, they're after finding something. But what it turned out to be was, and how it got out there, I don't know, it was the suspension of a Mini with a big rubber boot on it. <laughs> and kind of a, a chalice-looking shape on it. <laughs> so a terrible disappointment. Great excitement on the one hand, a terrible <laughs> disappointment on the other. I don't know what happened to the How it got out there, I don't know, because in a very remote part of the coast. I believe that there's a wreck at Spanish Point in Clare, and uh, it's reputed that uh, a mass grave of, of uh, remains of some of the survivors was found in recent years. Do you know anything about oh, that? I, I, I know of the mound, and I know of the fact it's called Dueling the Spinach. And that, that's, that's fairly common uh, to have that all up and down the West Coast. There's, there's places called Carrig Nespina, you know, uh, Port Nespanig and Dueling Nespanig. And that, that mound is reputed to contain uh, the bodies of uh, vi victims of one of the wrecks that were washed in. Now, I don't know whether it has ever been excavated or not, but it's a known fact. There's a ship called the Zuniga was wrecked on that particular coast there. But um, there are quite a lot of... Uh, place names uh, that have reference to Spanish things one way or another on that coast. I, I, I'm not aware now that any excavation has taken place and that remains have been found. I'd like to find out more about that, actually. Cormac, is um, Captain Quayla's diary, is that is that still obtainable? I don't know. Uh, it was it, it, it was freely available on the West Coast. I, I, I actually bought that particular one in Letter Freck in a shop that was there. There's another shops out there. I don't know whether it's been reprinted or whether it's available or not, but it's certainly a fascinating read. Yeah, I have a copy of it from years ago, Carmack, and if I'm not mistaken, uh, some talk afterwards was about perhaps taking a lot of what he said to praise himself with a slight pinch of salt because the survivor tells the good story, of course. Very well, be, yeah. But nevertheless, what I found if, fascinating yeah. about it, Peter, was the social commentary. Absolutely. His, 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 his remarks about the way people lived. And, I mean, he didn't exactly cover himself in glory because he was running around stark naked most of the time and being, being, uh, <laughs> being yeah. hidden from the English uh, and the tribal elders by the women. <laughs> yeah, and if I would imagine mistaken. he looked something like Antonio Banderas or someone like that, a handsome Spanish guy. No, I, I'm, gonna have to pull, the women. <laughs> I'm gonna have to pull it out again, Karmic, and look at it because I, if I'm uh, not mistaken, every, everything like that, well worth reading again. Yeah, Peter. if I'm not mistaken, there is a reference to it, and it's one of the early references one might find to a euphemism for a dalliance of some sort. He describes it as dancing at the crossroads. Oh, really? That's amazing, yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, no, super talk. Absolutely very enjoyable. It was really great, uh, Cormac. Uh, once again, thank you very much. My great pleasure indeed. And thank you, Al. Okay. Listen, just a final word. We said thank you all indeed for tuning in tonight. Thank, thank you, Cormac. Thank you, Cormac. Thanks very much. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Pass the talk, Cormac. Thank you.